For almost a decade, a dark cloud hung over this town, a reign of abuse that will cast shadows on young lives for lifetimes to come. He raped me, don't talk to me. He just laughed at me. She walked in and I'm touching me and then told her to get out, so she did leave. I didn't think I was ever going to be seen again. I was absolutely terrified. Girls were groomed, trafficked, abused, raped, and some were passed around to be sexually assaulted again and again. Now, finally, seven years later and after 11 months of court cases, this gang of 20 men are in prison for what they did. The last four of them sentenced today. Mohammed Akram, 17 years for the trafficking and rape of two girls. Niaz Ahmed, five years for inciting a child to commit a sexual offence and sexual assault. Mohammed Imran Ibra, three years for trafficking and actual bodily harm. And Asif Bashir, 11 years for rape and attempted rape. Many of the details of what these men did to their victims are so disturbing, we simply can't report them. And summing up today, the judge said it's likely that these girls will never recover from the abuse they have suffered. The way you treated them defies understanding. And yet, he went on to say, none of you have expressed any remorse for what you did. Between 2004 and 2011, this gang of 20 roamed Huddersfield searching for vulnerable girls, children, some as young as 11, to befriend, then ply with drink, drugs, and eventually abuse. Girls like Lucy. It's not her real name. She was first approached at 13, and at 15, this happened. Some of them had touched you and stuff like that, but it was the night that it actually happened, the night I got raped. Um, I couldn't remember because I was sober when I went there. The girl took me there and introduced me to him and left me at the house and I took one drink and I couldn't remember now else. But they all had videos and they had all sorts of me. But um, the only reason I knew was because the next day I woke up with no clothes on in the guy's bed in his house. How did that feel? It must have been terrifying. Um, I just acted normal because I didn't want him to think she's going to go to the police or she's going to go tell someone. So I just got home, asked for my clothes, walked out and just cried really, got home. Bath myself in bleach. <laughs> just felt dirty, really. Just absolutely dirty. I got locked in a car once. Basically, like, he locked me in the car and was asking me to do stuff. I didn't think I was ever going to be seen again. I was absolutely terrified. Lucy's ordeal that night wasn't unique. The moors overlooking Huddersfield became a dumping ground for girls who dared to answer back. Throughout the three trials of these 20 men, Girls told repeatedly of being beaten and left here in the dead of night, alone, cold and terrified. Kate, again not her real name, only found out what happened to her in court from the evidence of another girl because she was unconscious when it happened. It's marked her entire life since. It made a lot of sense because then like relationships had after hanging around with all them lot, they've just like been abusive and stuff like that as well. Relationships afterwards have been yeah. abusive. Has the relationships you've had afterwards been affected by the relationships you, by what happened to you? Yeah, because I was in um, a few domestic violence relationships as well, and I just thought it was normal. There is an uncomfortable question surrounding this case, the question of race. The majority of these men are British Pakistanis. The Pakistani community here say they're disgusted by what these men did. We need to look into our community with a magnifying glass. We need to scrutinise our ways. We've got to be a lot more open, frank and honest about what the problems are. We need to talk to our young people. The generations need to talk. We need to find out what's going on. But there are other bodies that need to look at the role they played too. Sometimes when I was out with them, the police had stopped the cars and I'd be in them and they'd just take me home. They wouldn't question them as to why you've got a young girl in your car. They'd just take me home. How do you feel about that now? Let down, really, because it could have stopped from then. Kirkley's council say they're launching an independent review of whether authorities failed the victims in this case. Maybe it will provide answers. Hopefully, it will provide some closure and a future for the girls, now women, 
who suffered so much in their past. That's been happening for decades. You know, this isn't something that's just um, popped up. We'd, we're now talking about it because of the exposures, you know, such as Rotherham and Rochdale and Telford and, and now Huddersfield. This isn't going to just all of a sudden go away because we're talking about it on the news and paedophiles and child rapists aren't going to say, oh, well, actually, you know, people such as Sammy mm. are on the TV, let's just stop raping children. It doesn't work like that. And, Sammy, when you were being groomed, did you feel that the authorities just weren't taking you seriously? Enough. I was never treated as a victim. Um, I was always treated as his girlfriend, his mistress, and somebody that was a part of his gang rather than somebody that was a victim to it. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of us were just viewed as, you know, little slags and, and these lovesick teenagers that kept going back. Yeah. We was always blamed, and unfortunately, that's still happening. I mean, when she says that this is still going on, you know, in large proportions, do you agree with that? Uh, it's as real now as it ever has been, and, and I think, as Sammy just said a moment ago, the, firstly, it has to be said that people like Sammy are extraordinarily brave, and it's victims and survivors that know more about this than us or any other practitioner or professional. But what they will tell you is that we've been incompetent in the past, and what we are now seeing is, in, in effect, a reckoning. We're getting substantially better at dealing with these types of cases, but we are still at the tip of the iceberg. Why, considering everything that we know now, everything that we've learned over recent years, over these painful trials that um, people like Sammy have had to witness, it's still going on. Well, the offenders, as Sammy's already identified, will do it anyway. Uh, they, they think they can get away with it, they'll carry on doing it. It's, uh, it's second nature to them. For the professionals... What do you mean by us, second nature to them? Uh, they, they enjoy it, they'll carry on doing it, they'll find somebody vulnerable that they can, uh, they can groom and sexually abuse, uh, and unless we step in, they'll carry on doing that. So that's the reality that we're dealing with. But when it comes to what the professionals are doing, some of it is resources. Uh, you know there's been a substantial reduction in the children's services and policing, etc. Etc. The victims of this type of behaviour don't walk into a police station invariably and say, look, I am being sexually abused. So you have to go out and seek them. You have to build trust and confidence to encourage them to come forward. You've got to give them lifetime support mm. after they do come forward. And I can assure you there are too many organisations, too many institutions that are not prepared to do that. To what extent um, is the community from which most, the vast majority of the men doing this, to blame? And we're talking about Pakistani British men. Matt, criminality begins and ends with a criminal. Let's start with that. And we all know that most sex offenders in this country are British white men. But when it comes to this type of model of grooming, street grooming, yes, British Pakistani men are disproportionately involved. And yes, there's great work going on. I'm sure Sammy's seen it. I've seen some great work happening up and down the country to try and engage with young people and young men to try and ensure that groomers of the future don't result. And also that they are able to identify those who are committing these crimes right now and refer it to the police. But it is still work in progress. And I'm, I'm always concerned, to be frank, uh, that once the circus has left town, once this case has been dealt with, mm -hmm. it goes quiet. Nobody does anything in the community. Nobody does anything in terms of professionals as well. Right. And then something else happens, suddenly they become excited, then they go away again. You have to do this relentlessly. He's now, like what? Groundhog Day. I feel like I'm in constant Groundhog Day. Uh, so we'll hear something on the news, we'll all make a big buzz about it, and then it all goes away, and a few months later we'll, we'll keep doing it. One of the causes of why this was allowed to, 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 to flourish in the past was the sensitivities given the ethnic identities of many of the perpetrators. Yeah. Is that still the case? I think so. I think, and I always say, you know, we're in 2018 and we still can't say Pakistani Muslim are child rape in the same sentence without being said, you know, we're racist, Islamophobic, or we're trying to brand an entire community. Now, I'm not trying to do any of that, and to be honest, I don't right. think many people but are. But do you want to be clear all, in your language? Yeah, all races commit abuse, and we need to accept that. We need to accept that, actually, some Pakistani Muslims are too. So let's accept that and then actually get on with tackling the problem. We need to have an honest conversation. Yeah. And strangely, I've begun to have this conversation now with people who previously weren't having it, about why it is that men from British Pakistani community feel that they can own, they can control these girls for their own purposes. And I, I, I'm sensing that maybe beginning to begin to tackle this issue rather than just simply thinking, well, it's a race issue. It's not a race issue, it's a male issue. It's about male power and male control. And additionally, in the British Pakistani community, there are other factors 
around no relationship education, mm. around loose networks, around the nighttime economy, etc., etc. But unless we have an honest conversation about it, it'll carry on happening. Is there a danger that if we're not absolutely clear what we're talking about here, if we're not honest with each other, that this debate can be hijacked, especially by the extreme right? Well, it has been, hasn't it? I mean, the right, uh, the far right, have tried to exploit this. They don't care about the victims. I've seen so many occasions, in some of the trials I've dealt with, they're determined for the case to be stopped in some way through a mistrial so that they will be able to say, look, there's no justice in the world, let's take the streets. So they don't have any interest in the victims. The defendant obviously wants to stop the trials as well because they get, mm. get away and they get away with this. We, bigots, as you know, Matt, don't need an excuse to hate us. So why do we give them an excuse to hate us? This is an issue the communities themselves should own and should deal with.